I want us this morning to think about worship and to really ask the question, why worship? Now, for you sitting here in this uh, service of Christian worship on a Sunday morning, that might seem like a fairly irrelevant question because you know why you're here and what you're here for. But nevertheless, many people are not here and many people give excuses for not being here. And uh, these can be put in a fairly humorous way from a little thing I picked up the other day where we see uh, excuses given, 10 reasons given for, given for why people never wash. And they, uh, they're quite, uh, quite fascinating and they can relate, I think, a little bit to, uh, to, to the excuses people give for not worshipping. These are the excuses, 10 reasons why I never wash. I was made to wash as a child. People who wash are hypocrites. They reckon they're cleaner than other people. There are so many different kinds of soap. I could never decide which one was right. I used to wash, but it got boring, so I stopped. I still wash on special occasions like Christmas or Easter. None of my friends wash. I'm still young. When I'm older and have got a bit dirtier, I might start washing. I really don't have time. The bathrooms are never warm enough. People who make soap are only after your money. And that is why I never worship either. Ten reasons. So just as soap cleanses our bodies, worship cleanses and renews our souls. Both are a response to faith. If you have no faith in soap and don't admit that you are dirty, then you won't use soap. If you have no faith in God and don't believe that he is worthy of worship, then quite simply you won't worship. And yet, in addition to this uh, rather humorous uh, uh, beginning, we, 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 we need to realize that um, there are modern attitudes that also get in the way of our worship. Modern life demands haste and watching the clock. Worship takes time. Worship really ignores time. Ideal worship would take no notice of time. It takes time to tune the spirit. It takes time to quieten the mind. Modern life is also very aggressive. Even our so-called games are aggressive. And worship requires humility and receptiveness and appreciation and gentleness. Modern life is also controversial. There's a lot of shouting, there's a lot of protesting, there's a lot of arguing. Worship requires listening, the listening ear, the accepting conscience, the willingness to learn, it requires humility. Modern life is also complicated. Worship demands simplicity and sincerity and quiet. And perhaps most difficult of all, modern life depends upon self-promotion. Self-promotion. Pushing yourself. Asserting yourself justifying yourself, selling yourself. And worship is the exact opposite. Worship requires prostration, that is throwing oneself at God's feet in humility and awe. 
it requires a, a sense of needing God's mercy and forgiveness, an awareness of our own creatureliness and mortality, requires being sorry for our sins, bowing the mind and the spirit in God's presence, bringing the conscience before God's will and purpose, before the Most High God. We do not promote ourselves in the presence of the Most High God. So worship is, is not about us and our self-promotion or our achievement or our esteem. It is exalting God. And yet, indeed, because of all of this, the need for worship is greater than ever before. And I want to highlight just uh, a couple of, of biblical examples, three biblical cameos, as it were, which show the importance for our soul's sake um, of worship. Firstly, we all know what it is to be under pressure, to be straining every nerve, as it were, to have one of those days when the wheels come off and keep coming off. And, uh, and in the more serious form, to even begin to doubt whether we can cope any longer. Or whether you can cope with some anticipated change or event or challenge in your life. And here is a young man in the Bible, and he is on the threshold of an enormous change, an enormous task and challenge. As a political leader, he'd inherited a divided nation that was in a real mess. They'd lost their vision and they were badly equipped. They were disunited. They were a mixture of tribes. And this young man's task was to build them into a nation, to weld them into a fighting force, to establish them into a settled, peaceful community. And there were enough enemies around. And he is a, a young man. He is timid. He is untried in leadership. He's probably full of self-doubt, uncertainty, worry, sweating with anxiety, not sleeping at night. And so one day, while walking in the country, and wrestling with these burdens, Joshua, Joshua meets an armed figure and challenges him as to his identity. Are you for us or against us? He asks. Neither, the figure replies, I have come as commander of the Lord's army. And Joshua worships. Joshua prostrates himself. He falls face down to the ground in reverence, in awe, and in worship. Take off your shoes, for you are standing on holy ground. And Joshua does so. And then he rises up from worship to face the future. And now with confidence and determination and hope and the strength of the Lord. So worship is necessary because it gives us a perspective on the giants in our lives, the overwhelming responsibilities, the fears, the anxieties, the weaknesses. All these must be seen against the background of the Lord's army. And in this case, the commander of the Lord's army who appeared to Joshua. And so we rise from our knees, we rise to our feet to face life again, to hear God's orders. We are encouraged by God's directions and by his reassurance. We can and we will cope, is the message. The commander of the Lord's army assures us, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to keep still. Mm -hmm. 
And then our second example comes from uh, comes from a situation of facing temptation. And we know what it is to be tempted, either acutely tempted or else chronically tempted. We also know what it is to fall to temptation, uh, to bear the shame of guilt, the burden of a moral failure. Praise God that we can also know the grace of, of forgiveness and, and redemption. But here is a, another young man who conquers temptation um, and he conquers it through worship. In the burning heat of his temptation, he says, you shall worship the Lord your God. That's how to deal with temptation. There in the wilderness, uh, all on his own, Christ was planning his ministry and thinking about how he would be obedient to his Father. And there came these bitter temptations. One, he could have a kingdom by the bribery of turning stones into bread. Or he could have the kingdom by the spectacular of magic. Or in other words, of fraud. Or he could have the kingdom by force. Worship power. Worship the world of power. Worship Satan. And Christ refuses all these temptations. And he replies to the tempter, in every case, worship and serve the Lord your God. Worship and serve the Lord your God. That is his anchor in this desperate moment of temptation. And that is his destiny, to worship and serve his Father. And so worship is our anchor in testing. Who knows what temptations are being wrestled with here this morning? Small ones, big ones, old ones, new ones. And we, 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 we do not turn away from God in times of temptation. We turn towards God. From God that will lead us away from the despair and the defeat and the guilt of temptation to worship. So that is the anchor, that is the, uh, the fountain of strength that we need. It is uh, a protecting and it is sustaining to worship the Lord your God. And Jesus shows us that it is the one, the one remedy against ma massive temptation. Temptations that concern not only his own destiny, but the will of God for his creation. And then we are told the angels came and ministered to him. And they will come to us as well, through our worship. And then thirdly, finally, in the face of suffering, and even death itself, worship lifts our spirits with a wonderful vision and an eternal hope. This time we have an older man. He's in exile for Christ's name. He's in prison for Christ's name. He is suffering for Christ's name. State persecution of the believers had, had begun with all the Romans' efficiency of making people suffer and die. And the church and the faith were in great danger, in dire peril. And yet this old man, his name was John the Apostle, it is his habit to fall into worship on the Lord's Day, on the Sunday. And being in tune with God's Spirit on the Lord's Day, he is given a vision, a vision of victory assured in heaven, of the eternal safety of believers despite the coming troubles and tribulation of the downfall of the evil empire at last and of the new city of God to come and all this is given to him as he falls to worship 
Let me just read that passage from uh, Revelation chapter 2. Just a few verses. John, your brother and com companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance, suffering, patient endurance, that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. This was John's testimony. Do you face suffering? Or where are you? Are you in the valley? Are you in the shadow of darkness? That's where John was. Do you fear death? The worship of the Lord will impart new hope and vision, the assurance of victory and complete confidence in Christ as well as a preview of heaven. That's why believers worship. These are some of the values of, uh, of worship in Scripture. They are very practical. They are very relevant. They are very exciting. Because worship is an event. For Joshua, for Jesus, for John, a happening no one should fall asleep in worship. No one should get bored in worship. No believer should miss this opportunity to be on the Lord's Day in the Spirit and to watch the Spirit moving among the people. We want God to do it again as He did at the first creation. We want to see God at work, new beginnings, we want to see people forgiven and healed and blessed. We want to see temptations conquered. We want to see vision given and all of us allowed a glimpse of eternal life. So will you go and spread that rumour please? A good rumour. Jesus is in the midst of us and things are living and lively. Things are happening. Joshua tells us, the Lord will fight for you, you have only to keep still. Jesus says, worship and serve the Lord your God, not Satan, not in any of his ways. And John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I saw the Lord. Um, just a little... Conclusion. Sometimes a child will leave uh, a friend's, say, birthday party complaining. That wasn't much fun. They never played the games I like. But so what? Surely what matters is that the birthday child had the games he wanted and that he enjoyed himself. The moaners have got the wrong center of attention. And that's often the, the matter with uh, those who say after church, I didn't get much out of that. The real question is, did God get much from us? Mm. Our love, our adoration, our praise, our submission. And in that Psalm 47 that, uh, that Trish read earlier, there's almost nothing about the feeling of the worshippers. Almost nothing. Other than their sense of awe at being in the presence of such a great God. He is the centre of attention in every sentence of that psalm. Every heart was turned to him. Everyone was concerned to give him a gift of praise that was worthy of the Most High God.
It's also a bit like that with wedding pictures. A wedding photograph is unacceptable if the bride and the groom are out of focus. <laughs> or even worse, can't be seen. <laughs> Aunt Agatha may be beautiful, she may be pin sharp in the picture, but despite what she thinks, she's not the one who matters on that day. The wedding couple must be seen clearly. Equally, no one can, can worship God meaningfully until he learns how to focus on what really matters, the bride and the bridegroom. Now let us pray. Lord God of glory, few of us will ever catch a glimpse of your splendor, which is brighter than the sun. But Jesus comes to each of us as he came to the disciples. He brings healing with his touch. He brings strength with his encouragement. And he brings the peace that banishes all fear. Christ is among us today. May our worship become trust and obedience today and in the week ahead as we continue to praise the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>